The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The weirdest thing about journalism, which always sort of shocks me, is you're just a stranger calling someone and saying, tell me about sometimes the worst thing that's ever happened to you, you know? Talo for Lover, I'm Madeline Chapman, editor of The Spin-Off. Welcome to Behind the Story, where I go behind the scenes of a big article on The Spin-Off from the week. The Spin-Off has always said it's an online magazine, and if it were a weekly print mag, these stories would be on the cover. If you want a weekly rundown of some of the best reads from The Spin-Off every Saturday, make sure you sign up to the weekend newsletter. Today I'm talking to senior writer Alex Casey about a very important story we published this week. Headlined Dead Naming, Insults and Harassment, Trains Corrections Officer Brings Landmark Human Rights Case Against Employer. Alex's long-form feature tells the story of Adam, a trans man who experienced bullying and discrimination at the prison where he worked after coming out as transgender. Alex is arguably this country's best journalist when it comes to telling these types of stories. Stories that show where New Zealand is at through the often traumatic experience of one person. I wanted to talk to Alex about the huge amount of time, research and off-the-page care that goes into taking something from an email to a long-form feature. Here's Alex Casey on Behind the Story. Welcome, Alex, to my podcast. Hi, man. It's great to be here. I'm sweating bullets. (laughs) (laughs) This is not an interrogation. You've already done the work. (laughs) I know. I don't know why I'm so stressed about this. I love the podcast, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to have you on because you published a very big story this week, and it is kind of indicative of both the spin-off and yourself as a writer, which is you go from your very quick, quick, funny, silly to quite an intense, big, often detailing a lot of trauma in a in a long form piece. How do you find these types of stories? Because they're not just kind of floating around everywhere. Mm, you mean like how do they come to my inbox? Yeah. Not how, how do, do I you... find them as an experience? <laughs> oh, very different things. No, I can sorry. tell you about that. <laughs> I haven't how... slept. <laughs> <laughs> how do you end up with this story to tell? Do the do people come to you? Yeah, well, this story in particular did come to me. It came um, from Adam's lawyer directly at the Office of Human Rights Proceedings. I have to get that right. This was one of the many things we talked about is the difference between the Office of Human Rights Proceedings and the Human Rights Commission. Um, But came into my inbox and said, there's this quite interesting case coming up. You know, I can kind of brief you on background. He is very keen to talk to media and have the story be quite public Um, I later found out a quite interesting detail that he was sort of motivated to speak out publicly after um, seeing corrections in the Pride Parade, Um, (laughs) which, you know, having read the story, you could understand how the image of that might grate on somebody who's been through, you know, the years of this kind of discrimination um, within the corrections world. So, yeah, she reached out to me and we kind of had a bit of a background chat and I was like, well, this sounds you know, absolutely like something I would like to do. And then I think I probably talked to you. And then there was, yeah, a little bit of back and forth in terms of when the case was actually being filed and all that sort of thing. Um, So it was probably about just over a month, I'd say, ago that it kind of came onto my radar. And oftentimes when you have a story like this, someone says, I would like to talk to somebody and you go, great. And it can just be you sit down, you have one interview, you write it up, you get some comment maybe from someone else and then away it goes like the next day or the day after. 
what is the kind of more involved process when it comes to these sorts of bigger, really quite sensitive stories and also dealing with a subject matter that, you know, people have had regrets about sharing their story or didn't think it would be told in a certain way? How do you kind of front foot a lot of those, uh, what can be conflict down the line? Yeah, it's a very different process and I like to spend you know, as much time as, well, sometimes, you know, the subjects don't want to talk for a long time, but I I always try and get, you know, multiple interviews with them. The first chat we had was actually not even on the record. You know, it was just a literally kind of like a get to know you chat. The weirdest thing about journalism, which always sort of shocks me is you're just a stranger calling someone and saying, tell me about sometimes the worst thing that's ever happened to you, you know? And like, it's a huge responsibility. And so I don't take that lightly. And I like to make sure that I really know the person who I'm talking to, but also that they know me and that they can raise any concerns about the process or, um, you know, discuss anonymity and all those sorts of things that can cause worries quite early on. So yeah, we, and I'd already had a big background chat with his lawyer. So I knew what the story was in terms of the details of, um, his experience, what I didn't have was his account of how that actually kind of felt, you know, to the human involved, um, which I think also helped because it means you don't necessarily need to go back and relitigate every single point. It's very much more about tell me who you are and how it felt to be you, not even at corrections, you know, like we spent a lot of time just talking about your, uh, you know, his upbringing and how it really feels to be someone who is born into the wrong body. Obviously, I'm a cis woman. I don't know what that experience is like. So it was very important that I kind of absorb that and communicate that effectively. So, yeah, we had, I think, three thorough chats overall over the course of about a month. And then there was a a sort of hasty follow-up when you pointed out a few holes (laughs) that we needed to fill in um, towards the end of the process. But, yeah, it's very much like, it's, there's also this kind of extra layer of almost like intimacy because I work from home and I you do it over video calls and, and he was working from home too, um, that I feel like, yeah, you just kind of get to know each other, I think, a bit more in depth than, yeah, if you were just having kind of a one-off interview in a, in a boardroom kind of thing. I think that's what um, people often talk about reporting and journalism. I know Janet Malcolm famously had that quote about all journalists I'm butchering it, but all journalists deep down know that what they do is essentially immoral or exploitation in order basically using other people to tell a sto- to tell an entertaining story and then kind of that's it. And I think certainly there are lots of people who have experienced that with their story being put in the paper or on the news or something like that. And that is something that I think is really evolving that level of kind of pastoral care that you have, where did you first, I guess, realise or sort of put that into practice how much outside, like, it's work really, but it's kind of like building a relationship that is involved in order to tell one story that a lot of people might read and just think, oh, yeah, they just went and spoke to them and took some quotes and then that's it, they never spoke again. Yeah, yeah. I think the first time we pr- I properly kind of put it into practice was, was it 2016 where Duncan and I wrote a story about um, a prominent figure in the New Zealand music community um, and his relationships with young women. And we were interviewing the woman and, you know, sort of over a course of many, many months about something deeply sensitive that they had never talked to anyone about. And, yeah, it was just, it's pretty instinctual to just sort of, you know, spend time with them and make sure that you do right by them and their stories and kind of opening up to you. Um, Yeah, I just feel like it probably also is just innate to me because I'm a very anxious, over-the-top person who sends a lot of follow-up emails and worries about everything endlessly. So it probably is just kind of natural that I am checking in with people a lot and um, (laughs) worrying if anyone is mad at me, (laughs) you know, all these different (laughs) sorts of things. Um, But, yeah, it is a huge part, especially with stories like this, um, that I I think you don't see in the story is, is how much often goes on 
behind the scenes. And it's also just a, a privilege to be able to tell these stories. So you don't want to take it lightly. You know, you want to make sure you, yeah, put put the adequate time in. I mean, you mentioned that this, you know, you got an email or you were contacted a little over a month ago, which as far as these sorts of stories go, that's an incredibly quick turnaround. Like compared to, this is a long form piece, there's multiple interviews, there's like contextual stuff, there's legal stuff. That's a it's a really fast turnaround, especially when you consider that a lot of these types of stories, which you have had as well, uh, they can take a long time and then sometimes they never end up being published. I mean, how do you kind of work with that in terms of not putting too many eggs into one story basket or being able to know when to kind of let a story go if you just don't think it's going to quite get to the finish line? Yeah, it's really hard and it's something that I I think I'm getting slightly better at is the sort of almost like triaging stories when they arrive in terms of what's actually going to be possible to get across the line. I mean, what obviously helped a great deal with this one is that it was brought to me by a lawyer. So there's already a certain um, network of robustness around documentation and evidence and, you know, the allegations themselves were not new information to the accused being corrections. It was kind of a different story and compared to stories I've done before where you're bringing out, you know, totally new um allegations to someone who might not have thought about them for 10 or 20 years. Um, But it is really difficult. And I do think you could feel the weight of it and feel a responsibility to everyone who brings their stories to you. Um, I think we're lucky at the spinoff that we do, I think, have a little bit more space and time to be able to do more of these stories and do them well. Unfortunately, you just can't do all of them. I mean, not this one in particular, but there have been stories in the past that it's just it's too legally difficult, you know, to do, or there's just not quite enough corroboration or um, people willing to go on the record or even, you know, on, on background and things like that. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBank. It is always kind of a little bit funny to me when I think that someone might read uh, some of your some of your best work and your long form investigations and things like that, and assume that you have no sense of humour. But you are also one of the funniest writers in New Zealand. How does that sort of being able to write extremely silly experience of going to Rachel Hunter's meditation show does that kind of complement or help when you're working on these quite serious and intense and like would be very easy to kind of get drawn into the sometimes quite despairing nature of them yeah I mean I I honestly it's it's like a godsend for me (laughs) as I'm sure you can probably sense and you well know mad I tend to run quite neurotic (laughs) and anxious and I I do feel stories like this quite deeply um so to be able to retreat for example tomorrow I'm driving out to Lincoln to go and see Brett and Angel (laughs) from Married at First Sight New Zealand season one (laughs) to talk about their seven year long you know TV marriage ahead of the new season um and I do think that is important to have different beats. And again, I do feel like that's something we're quite lucky to be able to do at the spinoff that we can kind of oscillate between uh, these different modes of working and these different issues. But I also think it's like, that's what people are, you know, like the amount of high level 
people that I talk to who are like, oh, I love The Bachelor, by the way. Or, you know, like <laughs> people are nuanced and complex and really smart people watch reality TV and some of the most serious journalists are very funny. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like it, that is kind of what life is. And there was definitely moments writing this story where there was levity and there often is in stories like this. It's that kind of like gallows humour when you've got people talking about really dark stuff. There's some really dark jokes that can come out too. <laughs> was there, you know, this is quite, uh, you said it did actually come up, not, not formed, but you obviously had these sort of legal documents and things like that, which really helped kind of put together a, a timeline and a sort of a list of, I guess, grievances and things like that. But was there anything that changed in how, how you thought the story would be told when you had that first conversation versus how it ended up being told or how it ended up being presented? Yeah. Well, I think the kind of central crux of the story, as, you know, his lawyer, Nicole Brown, put it, was this is a story of someone who was just trying to do his job and couldn't because of the way that he was. But what I didn't anticipate was the um, the kind of groundbreaking nature of the case itself in a legal sense, which truly was not, I don't think, even on my radar until maybe the second interview, when at the very end <laughs> um, his lawyer was like, oh, by the way, this might be a bit too kind of legally nerdy, but this is the first time that any court or tribunal will hear a discrimination case on the basis of sex involving someone who is transgender, ever. And I was like... Huh. <laughs> that sounds like something. <laughs> and then it just so happened that, you know, we published on the spin-off coincidentally just, was it last week? Last week, yeah. A piece about, you know, the ongoing kind of debate about whether the word gender should be added to the Human Rights Act alongside sex. And so it was just kind of in the air and the writer kind of saying that it goes back to 2006 when Georgina Beyer was pushing for gender to be added to the Human Rights Act and that basically a high-level legal opinion was presented to the Attorney General that said, you don't need it because sex should cover transgender people. But as the piece pointed out, that had never actually been tested before for 17 years until this case right now. <laughs> um, so there was this weird, you know, sometimes there's that weird just kind of cosmic synchronicity that happens, which meant that I had to sort of figure out a lot of legal stuff I knew nothing about. <laughs> and I do have to thank you and I have to thank Nicole, his lawyer, for her endless patience and generosity explaining what I'm sure are like unbelievably simple concepts to me <laughs> at the 11th hour. Um, but yeah, that Part of it, the kind of landmark nature of the case itself was definitely not something that I was was even on my radar when it first arrived. So that was just this kind of incredible byproduct that popped up along the way. And now that it is, I know that you were charting last night once we locked off all the copy and we were ready to go and it was and I was just gonna schedule it for this morning. That's not uh, that's not unique. To you, I think anyone who has written a big story and is kind of waiting for it to come out in the morning is sharting. How are you feeling now? You know, now that it's out, there hasn't been a kind of big collapse or anything like that. Um, you haven't, you know, is it accidentally just put in some sort of terrible language or something? Is there, <laughs> is there like a different feeling? Like, do you feel like there's a bit of a release or does it take a while to kind of move on to the next the next story? I mean, it takes a little while. And for all my catastrophizing, which I did, you know, at 3 a.m. last night, thinking about 75 different ways that um, everything could fall apart and come 9 a.m., um, the priority was always to make sure that the subject was happy with the story, you know, which you don't know until it's up. And that I hadn't done anything massively wrong from his lawyer's point of view and I wasn't going to do anything to actually sacrifice the very real world thing that is still happening for him. So once that kind of passes and I realise that that's all right. And also, you know, to start getting amazing comments on site, you know, of people standing behind Adam and supporting the story and being able to pass on those messages, that totally just alleviates all my heebie-jeebies that I have. Um, it's a very extreme way to live your life, to, to be so stressed and then so kind of overjoyed um, all within the course of a few hours. But, yeah, it's just been so nice to see because I know that we, 
you know, there is always anxiety, right, about the comments, particularly on stories involving, you know, trans rights and even prisons alone are complex spaces to explore. Um, but as far as I'm aware, it's been, yeah, hugely positive. And it's just awesome to see our audience kind of, you know, get the story and support it and be able to pass on some of those messages to him. Um, yeah, really makes a difference, I think, because that was the one thing I really wanted to emphasize in the story as well is just how long he kind of shouldered this entirely alone. You know, like this was over a year of since coming out to corrections that he was, yeah, just feeling like incredibly isolated. And it's it's kind of amazing to be able to have a hand in, in sharing that, that story for him. So you've spoken or you've heard from Adam today? We've emailed, yeah, we've emailed. Mm-hmm. How does he feel about sort of your, I guess, your version of taking his story and presenting it to the world, I guess? I will say he's a man of very few words, but my impression is that an email, that he was happy with it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's good. I'm happy with that. <laughs> I mean, I should note that Adam is a pseudonym, is a changed name, which is not uncommon for stories like this, especially when someone is sort of detailing quite a intense or traumatic time in their life um, and they don't want to be identified. How do you, when it comes to working with like a an anonymous, it's not an anonymous source because you know who they are, but when you're trying to present that person to readers, especially when it is a topic like this where you really want to make sure that the reader is connecting to the human person that's at the center of the story and often the way that most places would do it is you have a photo of the person you should look at that there's a real face on a real person a lot of your stories that uh, have been these really big pieces we've not been able to put photos with the story how do you kind of make the person three-dimensional without being able to show who they are or even like put too much detail in terms of describing how they look or what their interests are or where they live or how old they are um yeah how do you how do you try and humanize a kind of figure without identifying them Mm. it is it is tough and obviously this story in particular there was like very high stake safety concerns around um him being identified so that was always front of mind in terms of where that line was for example, we just settled on like a North Island prison and, you know, I, I alluded to some of his hobbies and things towards the end without getting too specific. But again, I think it probably just goes back to that thing of like, I just really asked him to tell me about your life, <laughs> you know, tell me about what it was like being you outside of work before we even get into, I guess, the news of it all to the actual kind of crux of the story. Tell me what it was like to be you growing up and I was pretty amazed at how forthcoming he was with um, all of those details. And yeah, historically, like in other stories I've done, particularly if it's about a certain, I have done a few stories, I guess you'd say in the kind of me too space, particularly about like young women and their relationships with older men. And I've always found um, getting people to talk about themselves as, as children and teenagers is often like a very... I don't want this to sound cynical, but like a very useful way of coloring out someone's life, like, because then they're they're kind of seeing themselves from a distance in a way. Um, And it just so happened that, you know, for this story in particular as well, teenagehood and growing up is also like puberty, which for someone who is trans is also a particularly difficult time. So just drilling into those like very specific experiences, I think, and really painting that picture before we got to any of the stuff about the case or corrections meant that, well, I would hope that it would be very hard for people to not (laughs) care by the time they get to the actual instances of discrimination because you've got to know this person. Again, I think also kind of because we were doing the interviews from home, I was very reminded that this was like a full person with a full life and a bedroom and posters behind him. You know what I mean? Like, so there was just, yeah, I don't know. I, I tried very hard to capture the full human as best I could to not make him kind of 
just a shadowy stock image, <laughs> you know, crouch like that, which I feel like sometimes anonymizing people kind of just turns them into this sort of grey shape that people struggle to connect with. Yeah. And again, I just have to shout out Adam for being very generous and with my constant kind of annoying questions about and how did that make you feel and what was that and tell me more about that he spent a lot of time talking about this already you know it's been many many years and it was also amazing to me to find out that it's still going to be probably another year until this is even heard in a court so you can just imagine the kind of stamina required to do something like this as well as talking to media is just like incredible so you've sort of for now closed this story in that it is published and it has been, you know, well received by the subject, which is always quite a factor for, for these types of stories. Do you have any other sort of stories, you know, to say the topic, but do you kind of, do you always sort of have these longer stories percolating in the background for when you get the time or when they suddenly become a little bit urgent or someone's ready to talk or there's a development in the case? Yeah, I always tend to have one or two on the boil. I mean, part of that is so I feel, again, so you can kind of do that pivoting because sometimes I feel start to feel a tremendous amount of guilt or indulgence if I've spent too many months writing about, you know, the traitors New Zealand or something. Um, I think it's important to balance it out. I'm working on a cover story at the moment about quite a different social issue, but something that I'm... Um, you know, also as passionate about as gender issues. Um, oh, I suppose it actually is a gender issue. Um, little tease for you. <laughs> and yeah, there's a few more other kind of big nuggety things I'd like to get stuck into um, when I get the time. But you know, Married at First Sight is just around the corner as well. So <laughs> got to be realistic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex Casey, for coming on Behind the Story and for probably speaking out loud for the first time today. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. It means a lot. Red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> <laughs> you can read Alex's feature, Dead Naming, Insults and Harassment. Trans Corrections Officer Brings Landmark Human Rights Case Against Employer. Right now on the spinoff.co.nz. It is a long-form article, so I'd recommend getting comfortable and reading it over a coffee. I'll be back next week with another spin-off writer and another big story. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire, here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas, tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.